very warm welcome to everyone here for tonight's discussion entitled Seeking Diversification Through Efficient Portfolio Construction Using Cash-Based and Derivative Instruments. I'd also like to welcome James Keats, the recipient of the Towers Watson Prize for Financial Economics for the April 2012 examination session. Um, established in 2002, the Towers Watson Prize for Financial Economics is awarded for the best performance in subject CT8. So I would now like to ask James to come forward to receive his prize. Thank you. Um, now before I invite Malcolm to talk to us about his paper, um, I'd just like to say a few words about the paper myself to um, hopefully stimulate uh, some discussion. I think that the paper covers some important issues at the moment, looking both at how to measure diversification and how to achieve it. And I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion on many of the areas raised and also on some areas which aren't covered explicitly by this paper. Um, I found the work on measuring diversification particularly interesting and it's occurred to me for a while that a large number of institutional investors should be much more aware of the extent to which their apparently diversified investment strategies are actually providing diversification. And it would be interesting to hear from uh, members of the audience how well they think that investors appreciate this lack of diversification and, and how people generally think about diversification. Um, the question then turns to how you actually deal with this issue. Um, correlations of a range of asset classes with global equities are, are shown in the, uh, in the paper, and it's noted that correlations can be unstable over time. Um, I think it's interesting to think about this also in terms of more colour around the shape of the relationships and the degree of stability between the relationships of different asset classes, and also levels of tail dependence. So the extent to which anybody in the audience is also thinking about these issues, it would be interesting if you were able to share your views here. It's also, I think, important to recognise that increases in correlations are sometimes a symptom of stressed markets and can be thought of as a side effect of things like um, liquidity um, issues that are in the marketplace. And when markets don't like risk, everything that contains risk and can be sold it is often traded at the same time and prices all move in the same direction together, which is why you have correlations increasing. And whilst derivatives can provide increased diversification. There is a risk that the liquid nature of the exposure that you can get may limit the extent of diversification if you are using just derivatives. The alternative is to use exposure to premia other than market risk premia, such as liquidity premia. And it would be interesting as well to, to hear the extent to which investors in the room and advisors in the room think in these terms as well, and the way in which people think about different risk premia and the level of diversification it is possible to, to achieve. Staying with market risk, it was good to note the presence of some alternative market risk premia in the paper, which do appear to have lower correlations with more traditional market risk. And uh, large cap versus small cap is the, uh, one of the examples that was shown. And it would be interesting to hear if other people are recognising these as risk premia and investing in these terms. In terms of the derivative use, there seem to be two main areas that are covered in the paper. The use of derivatives for explicit hedging and the use of derivatives for diversification. Explicit hedging uses are covered in some detail and many of the potential issues with um, hedging with derivatives are addressed. Um, I think it would also be interesting to think about some of the practical considerations though. This is already quite a detailed paper so there is limited space in the paper for um, some of these considerations and things like the European Market Infrastructure Regulation or EMEA um, are specifically excluded. But I think areas such as this and areas such as um, volatility smiles and, and basis risk and, and practical implementation issues um, are also important and if this has either deterred people from um, taking on some of these strategies or people have been aware of them but have used these strategies anyway, that would be interesting to hear about. Finally, a lot of the motivation around this paper seems to be on the topic of systemic risk. 
And whilst the paper talks about how systemic risk, risk can be measured, it's also worth considering ways of mitigating this risk. And it's not necessarily the case that derivatives can fully um, prevent issues arising from systemic risk, particularly if everyone has exposure to the same sorts of derivatives and all strategies remain similar. So we'd be interested to hear any other thoughts on this issue. First, though, I would like to hand over to Malcolm to introduce his paper. Okay, thank you. Okay, good evening. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight and introduce my paper. Um, thanks again for the opening comments, which I think give a, a good overview of some of the issues that are raised uh, within the paper tonight. To begin with, I start with a quote, and hopefully those at the back can, can see this. It's a bit too small, but it's one of my, my favorite quotes. Uh, and I'm not sure how many of you, uh, if any of you have ever come across this guy, uh, John Allen Paulos, um, a commentator seen on the sort of financial news channels, professor in America. And he had this great idea back in the late 90s, early 21st century of using all this mathematics, Markovitz and co with all the various um, variations that had gone on since then, improvements, and apply it to his own investment portfolio. And what he found out is uh, he lost his shirt and a whole lot more investing in WorldCom. And obviously the tech wreck took him to pieces. And so to me, it was always a classic lesson is you can be very smart and lose a lot of money in maths and investment. But one of the quotes he has, and I think it's a very good quote, and I think it is something that uh, applies in, in terms of almost like how, how actuaries think in terms of uncertainty is the only certainty there is, you know, and knowing how to live with insecurity is the only security. And it's something that I think that should capture the essence of investment. And in a way, in some of, one of the underlying themes of my questions, the actuarial profession, you know, is how can we use the skill set we have in a world of investment. So the background to the paper, it actually began as a working party uh, paper uh, that we presented at the Financial Risk and Investment Management Conference um, earlier uh, in, in 2012. In fact, one of my, my colleagues at the working party, uh, Jeff Neat, is in the audience. Um, and it's something that we came together. We were all um, very much practicing actuaries in a world of investment but almost thinking, well, what do we as actuaries in investment do when you, take the word, when you take the word liability out of the equation? Looking at pure investment, you know, portfolio construction, thinking about asset classes, what role does the actuary play? The paper itself builds on quite considerably from the, the working party paper. And very much the, the themes that I, I look to cover um, in the next 20 minutes are, you know, measurement of portfolio diversification. And it's something that is very, very important. And it's links to success, systemic risk. The benefits uh, of using derivatives to implement investment strategies. And a lot of my, you know, my background is as an investment manager for a number of years where the word derivative is something that is not usually warmly received in a lot of audiences I go to. I talk to a lot of pension schemes around the UK. But to think about what are the benefits of using derivatives, and ultimately, as I hope I demonstrate, it's not really the derivative bit that's important, it's the diversification part that's really important and the role that derivatives play in delivering that diversification benefit uh, the paper that you know, discussed tonight, I'm looking at longer market term exposures and market-based exposures. And again, a lot of the risk methodologies are based around these sort of longer term market exposures rather than high frequency trading um, strategies that investment banks might use. So again, thinking in more time frames for, for longer term investors. But the question at the bottom is one, I have, I'm generally interested, genuinely interested in what the, the, the audience have to say is, Take the word liability out of the equation for actuaries. What do we really think we can add to the world of investment in terms of constructive input? 
Now, in terms of introducing, if you like, the, what's wrong with the old multi-asset approach, uh, what I've done here is I've used, well, I've used the standard life balance fund, but I could have used any uh, UK balance fund because they were all pretty much the same because they all followed the same asset allocation over the years. And I've looked at a rolling annualized three-year return and taking that all the way back to the, the 90s. And so what you can see on the sort of left-hand side of the chart is, for the most part, that blue line is, is you know, quite high up. It's above what I put a, a sort of a, a line across there, the, the orange line, which I've put as a typical re return, which is basically sort of the level that uh, actuaries used to assume for return on assets in their pension scheme valuations. And basically, in the 90s, the, you know, your returns were comfortably above what you were assuming and everyone was happy because that meant surpluses, contribution holidays, and the world was a lovely place. Clearly when we went into the tech wreck and the bear market at the turn of the 21st century, you had a massive change in outcomes, you know, which coupled to a lot of other changes going on in pension schemes, because certainly investment, poor investment performance wasn't the only thing that was changing, but obviously led to a lot of difficult markets. You know, we've had the recovery that went on in the, in the, the first part of the you know, mid part of the noughties. And then, of course, we had the global financial crisis, where, again, what has showed that despite people having added more asset classes to their sort of uh, multi-asset approach from the first tech wreck and looked for more diversification, in reality, you know, the overall multi-asset approach is still prone to failure and to, to market risks. Another way of looking at that is to look at how diversification benefits, as measured by correlation, have really changed. And what this shows, the bars show, are the, the average correlations of a range of asset classes from property on the left-hand side through to high-yield bonds on the right-hand side. And the dark bars represent, if you like, the, the average correlation from 2000 to 2007, in which you, you can see the correlations are quite low, and again, when you think about diversification, the lower the correlation, the better, in terms of how you build portfolios. If you can find things that have low correlation or negative correlation to growth assets, then that builds a very good portfolio. So for the most part, you know, adding more diversification, investing in you know, high yield bonds, emerging market bonds, commodities, all of these extra things looked like they were adding a lot more diversification um, into, the, into the mix, and, and they did. And the problem being is, once everyone starts investing in these diversification opportunities, half the diversification benefit starts disappearing. Okay, and post the financial crisis, what you'll see is that the lighter blue bars, the correlations are a lot higher. Okay, which, and there are a variety of reasons for this, but the bottom line, from a portfolio constructor's perspective, you know, what I think are good diversifiers are actually not as good you know, as they used to be, or are likely to be in future. So what can you do in terms of diversification? Well, first and foremost, it's important to try and get a measure of what we mean by, measure, by portfolio diversification. And actually, there's no single measures that exist uh, at all, although there is a growing level of academic literature on systemic risk, okay? And that is something that we've seen more and more papers on in, in the recent years. And in particular, you know, in terms of definitive measure diversification, a lot of it is based around the, in the, the, the mathematics of principal component analysis, which really basically looks at, you know, underpan, you know un looks to investigate, you know, correlations and sophistication of correlations underlying your asset data that you have, okay? The work that uh, has been done. Some of the best known work in, in the marketplace at the moment is done by Kritzman, uh, who did a paper for, uh, for MI, MIT looking at diversification using something called the absorption ratio. Uh, for the benefit of the presentation for the paper, I've taken it a step further using work that we've developed internally, uh, which uses principal component analysis and from the world of physics uh, entropy to basically come up with measures that look to really measure diversification in two ways. And now, first and foremost, one, how much diversification is in a given portfolio? And then given that investment universe, how much diversification benefit exists there? 
in reality, talking about the methodology could be a paper in itself and a discussion in itself, and the fact that the authors, you know, the developers of the methodology will be doing a published paper later this year for their professional journals. Uh, so please keep out a look for that if you're interested. But in terms of trying to, you know, again, looking at the output, what does that mean? What, what am I actually talking about? It's easier to actually go back to the world of UK pension plans. And what I've done here is I've taken the, what is a, an average UK pension portfolio and I've used the purple book measures, which effectively, as a, you know, the last purple book I looked at, you had seven broad asset classes and you've got sort of the allocation to them. So there's a couple of equity asset class classes, there's three in bonds, one in real estate, one in hedge funds, and you get the sort of the average allocation that the UK pension scheme has. So what you have is seven asset classes, okay? But in risk terms, how many do you really have? I mean, because you know that the equity ones will behave quite similarly together, and the bond ones will probably behave quite similarly together. And through the effective factor methodology, and all the effective number of assets is, and that's that, the red um, line at the bottom, what it tries to say is, okay, you've got seven asset classes, but in reality, how many independent clusters of risk can you come up with that effectively describes the behavior of the seven asset classes you have for the weightings you've got in them at the moment? And in reality, over time, you know, given the heavy weighting that pension schemes have in equities, in reality, the number of sort of different types of risk has been anything between one and a half and two and a half, which you can effectively think of as equity and interest rate risk. The downside of principal components analysis is you never really know what the risks are, but you can work out the broad proxies for them. Now, in terms of that universe of seven asset classes, the reason you don't get much diversification is because of heavy weighting in equities. You can, by changing the weightings, get a much broader level of diversification, as indicated by that blue line above, which is the maximum diversification potential for the universe. What that looks like in proxies to in reality is a sort of broad risk, a equal weighting by risk across these equity and bond and real estate categories. And unfortunately, while she might be getting more diversification for a pension scheme, that might look like, well, I've got to invest more in bonds. One, bonds are expensive. Two, from my valuation perspective, I'm going to have to lower my long-term level of return. So it's not, yes, it'll give you more diversification benefit, but as many trustees, you know, pension schemes will say is, well, sorry, I still need my return. Yeah, I'm aware I'm not going to get my diversification, but I still need my return. So what can you do? Okay, let's re redefine the investment challenge then. Okay, you want a better diversified investment portfolio, okay, but you still want to get good return, okay? Allocating more to bonds just isn't going to do it, okay? Now, using the methodology, uh, just extrapolating the methodology we use in terms of how can you get more diversification? Well, just look at more asset strategies for a start. Okay, that's the first thing you can learn. And so allow a broader un universe, you know, why not? You know, in terms of strategies that make money, you can make money in currencies, you can make them in asset classes and specific sectors. You can look across geographies and look for ways to make money or money between two asset classes. Effectively, there's lots of ways of making money in the world, especially in terms, even on a sort of three year view, so I'm not talking about trying to make money on a week. Longer term views, you can make money. What you'll notice about some of them, though, is that they're not traditional, and in fact, to, to implement some of these strategies will will need <laughs> the use of derivatives. Okay. So let's have a look at that. Okay, what I've done here, again, hopefully you can all see it at the back, is I've picked nine strategies. All these nine strategies, I say, you know, I believe, will make money in the future. But what they are, the, the, the level of the line is, the, the bar is driven by the diversification or the correlation, okay? And remember, 
the more diversification or the negative correlation we have, that means better diversification in your portfolio. So let's look at the three groupings that we have. The ones, the strategies that provide the least diversification, well, I put here UK equities, high yield equities, and, uh, and high yield credits, sorry, and Russian equities. And as you can see, so they sound quite different to global equities, but their correlation is actually quite high. Now, when you move it to the next column, bonds, and I've chosen one from the world, uh, Mexican bonds, emerging market debt, global inflation-linked bonds, so inflation-linked debt, and credit, UK corporate bonds. We know intuitively you get more diversification, and actually you do the numbers, and you know, yes, you do, get the cor you do get reduced correlation, some negative correlation, which is good, but the challenge being, of course, is bonds after 30 years of going up are now historically incredibly expensive, and so trying to find bond strategies that you think can make money as well as provide diversification becomes more tricky. Now let's go to the right hand side. Now if I didn't have that top piece of telling you what the strategies were, and it was all things being equal, and I said pick three strategies you have given that all of them can make money, and you know that you know, the, best, the better diversified ones you have are the ones you want, then you'd pick the three on the right hand side. Okay, but what are those three strategies? The first one, it's a strategy based on the idea that you know, over three years, you know, the, the difference between European bonds you know, have 10 years maturity versus five years of maturity, that difference in the yield gap will be a lot higher than it is today. Or it's based on a, the second one is based on a view that you know, over three years, the, the euro will be a lot cheaper than it is today versus the dollar. Or the third one um, is based on the idea that whether US equities do well or badly over the next three years, large cap equities should do better than smaller cap equities. Okay, they're just three strategies. Okay, do they have statistical risk premium? As in if you do endless analysis and say, oh, is that statistically proven? Well, the answer is probably gonna be no. But in terms of an investment time horizon, and I could talk about three years, and if you want to define three years as a risk premium, then yeah, these opportunities exist if you have the ability to take them. But what you notice about all three of those strategies is you'll need derivatives to do them. So in terms of searching for diversification, diversification exists in the world today. To access it, you do have to go and use derivatives to allow you to do that. One of the additional benefits you have as well, once you move away into this world of I want a bigger universe to expand my diversification opportunities is the idea of having some sort of strategic asset allocation disappears because your range of universe is going to be big and you're going to choose whatever you think is going to be working for you. And in essence, and I say this as an investment manager for the past 25 years, I always find it incredibly frustrating you know, that working in an investment house where there's fantastic levels of research being done, you get to the world of multi-asset investment and you have to come up with two views. You know, am I overweight, under equi you know, over underweight, overweight, underweight on my equities v bonds and which equity markets, bond markets, do I be underweight or underweight? It's an incredibly inefficient use of the information that exists going around any investment house. A far better use of that information is to allow the fund manager to effectively construct a portfolio of strategies that will provide the diversification that's necessary to build a portfolio that's going to have a robust performance in a wide range of scenarios. So back to my UK pension scheme example, and I, the blue line at the bottom now represents the UK pension plan. And as you can see, for its seven asset classes, in reality, it looks around about two different clusters of risk. What that means is it's very vulnerable to, to bad markets, to stress markets, and that's what you've experienced in terms of the performance within those type of funds. What you see within a multi-asset unconstrained portfolio by, example, by, by comparison is shown on, on the top bit where this is a is a real life multi-asset portfolio that uses traditional strategies and derivative based strategies. Now it has around about 30 positions in, so you know, but 
some of those are going to be correlated, but in terms of how many different effects or how many different clusters of investment risk exist, you know, the, the, the methodology shows anything between you know, eight and 12 different levels or different types of investment risk. Okay? And what that means, you know, put simply, is that it just makes the portfolio a lot more robust to different market forces, okay? because it, it's not going to be swayed as much. It has much more rigidity in terms of being able to deal with different types of disasters that happen in week to week in the investment markets. In terms of how that analysis can be done, you know, I'd welcome views from the audience as to whether you know, this analysis has any benefit at all. The paper discusses some potential uses of it, and again, I welcome ideas from the audience. So now you've got this portfolio of ideas in terms of you know, building, constructing a portfolio, this is where you have to move away from traditional asset allocation because one, you're dealing with multiple asset classes with different volatilities, and also you know, for some of those strategies when you implement by derivatives, you don't actually physically put all the money there day one. Okay, so using risk-based construction is just a, a very simple way to go about this. Um, and again, standalone investment risk that I talk about here you know, is certainly you know, not something dissimilar from people who work in the world of enterprise risk management, thinking about you know, how risks can be split. But in terms of a, a simple example, you know, I put in the bottom bullet, you know, US equity, you know, measured by a model, might have historic volatility of 23%. If you invest 10% of your portfolio into that strategy, then the risk at the fund level of that single strategy is just 10% of 23% or 2.3%. Okay, so what you've done is you've deconstructed a strategy, you've taken account of its size, of its volatility, to come up with a number that represents the risk at the fund level. And why would you use this approach? Well, hopefully this helps explain why you use this approach in a multi-asset portfolio, you're going to have lots of different asset classes with different volatilities, and again, you know, some are invested, some you physically invest, some you don't. So let's go through the examples here. But the first sort of hoop you see on the left-hand side is our US equities, where the nominal holding is the, if you like, the darker color, and the strategy volatility is the lighter color. So if you take that one, it's US equities, you can see the volatility is above 20%, you know, investing around about 10% of the fund in it. And so the standalone risk, which is the green bar at the bottom, gives you a number, 2.1%. Now, if you go to the next one along, Russian equities, you know, guess what? Russian equities are a whole lot more volatile than, than US equities. In fact, around about twice as volatile, okay? But if you invest a much smaller amount, in your portfolio in something twice as volatile, you can come up with a standalone risk that's less, as you can see in the bottom graph. And so you work your way along where strategies here, whether the currencies, relative value, bonds, because you have the same approach, looking at historic volatility and the size, you have a methodology that is very consistent for measuring the different types of risk. And probably the ones of most interest are the ones on the right-hand side for me, where you have strategies where you see these big, big dark blue bars, so big dark blue bars or big nominal holdings, as you can see that 20, 25% holdings. But what you can barely see is the volatility of these strategies. These strategies are ones based in very short dated bonds, two year bonds, two year bonds. The price volatility is not much at all. So if you have an idea about making money in a two year bond position, quite simply, you have to invest quite a lot of money in them. So what you have on the bottom is a constant way of measuring risk that allows for the size and volatility. And as you can see from the top side of that chart, you know, the actual size of any holding is meaningless unless you know what the volatility of the thing that you're investing in is. Okay, so in terms of your multi-asset portfolio, and this is too small to read, okay, how can you calibrate how much risk you're taking? Okay, 
This is just a methodology where you use historic returns and historic correlations. Okay, so it's not rocket science in terms of what it is, you know, how many you know, weaknesses are there in this approach, uh, quite a lot, but it gives you a, a good perspective or a good first feel guide on the risk that you want to take, where you know, effectively, if I had this same sort of approach to investing in an equity portfolio, and I already said equity portfolio is around about 20, 22, 20, 23%, you just have one big bar of investment risk, okay, that's out there searching for return, okay, which is great, fantastic if it works, but the problem is it's just one risk, okay, and that risk, when it misbehaves, as we know in global financial crisis, things misbehave in multiples, you know, it, it's difficult. So isn't it better in terms of when you're trying to search for something that delivers a longer term equity risk premium, to, if you like, put simply, break that one large, big bet into as many smaller individual risks, where rather than just placing all of your investments in one asset class, or even in the one asset class across geographies, you split that investment risk across geographies, asset classes, you know, wherever you can find diversification, okay? Because, back to the point you know, Paul made in the introduction, you want to make sure your investment risk is as widely diverse as, as, as diversely dissipated as possible, because in a world of multiple market traders, a number of whom behave together, if you can find people who trade iris differently, irrespective of what's going on in other markets, you get genuine diversification. So in terms of this model, in terms of you know, looking at a very simple test, you know, what happens if all my, my little risks go wrong, the correlation to one scenario, you just simply add all the investment risks here, okay, and you come up with a number, you know, around about 22, 23%, which again is similar to, you know, volatility, historic volatility on, on equities for the model, for when this model was run, okay. When you allow for historic diversification benefits, you know, you come up with an expected volatility, that like a small blue bar at the bottom, something considerably more. So you get exceptional diversification. You know, is that accurate? Well, the one thing, you know, we know a no, number of things, models are inherently flawed, okay? You know, all models are wrong, some are useful, you know, to quote George Box. But what it gives you a feel for, you know, in terms of what you know is in stress scenarios, Volatilities are underestimated, diversification benefits are overestimated. But what that gives you, again, intuitively mixing what you know, is by spreading that risk as widely as you can find, you're certainly mitigating the dangers of, you know, of losing money in stress marketplaces. Now, when I did this, and I added up all the nominal exposures, and as I said, the nominal exposures by themselves are meaningless, but you can add them up and come up with a, a, a bigger meaningless number, but it's one that quite rightly get, gains attention. It, you know, these nominal exposures all add up to 220% for this portfolio, and that then leads to the question of leverage, and you know, most people's you know, knowledge of leverage is obviously, oh, that's quite bad, isn't it? And it certainly was in 2008. So let's investigate. Okay, now leverage in its very traditional format is you had a portfolio, say, of equities, and you like that, so that's, to leverage it, you go and borrow money from somebody else, invest that in equities, and you'd have a leveraged portfolio. Okay, and you can do that, same idea, and I've done, if you like, used three examples uh, in, this, uh, in this chart where I've chosen US equities, UK corporate bonds, and Australian short-term rates. And again, using the same methodology, standalone risk, and using the historical volatilities and using a leverage factor, you come up with a portfolio risk on the right-hand side where you know, three times you know, leveraged corporate bonds looks yeah, same as equities. But you know, on the face of it, you know, 10 times leverage Australian interest rates, well, that looks quite good, okay? But the problem being, for all of these examples of leverage is you're dealing with one risk factor, okay? So the lowest risk portfolio is the most leveraged. Problem being, of course, that when it goes wrong, it can go really wrong, okay? 
because right? one factor misbehaves. Okay, and then you know what you saw, leverage credit, which is a very, very popular strategy for most of the, the noughties, uh, really came a cropper in 2008. And in fact, you know, people talked about at the time having events that were a 25 standard deviation event on a, you know, on a VAR basis. Now, just to give you a feel for that, that means that the probability of that happening is less than one day in the whole history of the universe. So you'd have to count yourself quite unlucky to, you know, if you could leave the model on that. But it makes a core point. Numbers are numbers. You know, investments are real markets where people trade. Okay. So looking at those factors, get back to the portfolio we looked at, 226% nominal exposure, but is it one risk? You know, could you say it's 2.2 leverage? Well, no, because you know, even if you do the statistical principal components analysis, the effective factors, you've got eight to 12 independent effects within the risk. So leverage, you know, when has portfolios leveraged or not? So the general question I have, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I deal with a portfolio which has consistently got over 100% uh, exposure, but you know, I, I would never say it's leveraged. Okay, we know models are wrong. Okay, so what can we do? One of the things we're always worried about is having unintended concentrations of risk. How can we look at that? Let's look at stress, stress scenarios. Okay, you can have two types of stress scenarios. One, historical, two, forward-looking. Historical scenarios are always good to look at because, you know, they have one thing in their favor. You know, they've actually happened. You know, you're not making it up. It happened, okay. Using modeling, again, modeling techniques, you can, destruct, you can deconstruct a portfolio today, look at how, if you like, those factors that break it down, you can break it down into, look at how those behaved in stress markets, so if you like to reconstruct how your portfolio today might have performed in those different scenarios. So here, uh, we put on the left-hand side a range of different, a range of different disasters, whether they're equity, market, technical, you know, um, technology breakdowns, financial meltdowns, currency crises, wars. You know, basically, you're looking at, you know, for doing any historical scenarios, you know, your in interest as an investment manager is to try and find as many historical scenarios that investigate whether you have any unintended concentrations of risk. The light blue bars look at how much the equity markets moved. The darker blue bars show the performance of the the multi-asset portfolio. So in theory, I always talk about having more different types of, you know, your risk, you know, split, into, you know, dispersed as widely as possible. When you see, if you like, the, the likely performance of the multi-asset portfolio in, if you like, stress markets, you get that same effect, you get that reflected, okay? Because, put simply, you've diversified your risk. The other way of looking at it is think about future scenarios because the one downside of the historic scenarios is it may not be the worst outcome for your portfolio. Okay, there may be other things happening in the world in terms of how correlations are changing, how investor behavior is changing, that you will become unintentionally exposed to having your risk concentrated. So future scenario analysis, I cover it briefly uh, in the paper. It's certainly something you know, uh, my investment company is working more on, but it's something, if you like, where you know, both generally talking about diversification metrics and, if you like, the, the actuary's pragmatic view of how the world works, where you know, I genuinely believe this is somewhere where the actuarial profession can add something constructive in terms of the ongoing discussions that go on in pension schemes between the investment consultants, the, the actuary, and the trustees. But I'd be interested in views. Finally, of course, another way of looking at it, you know, you've done all your risk modeling, but there's nothing quite like looking at what's happening in reality. And again, for, you know, all I've done here is a very simple, you know, um, histogram looking at distribution of returns of the, if you like, the, the multi-asset constrained portfolio, which is the, if you like, the, the, the bars and the, the blue line, which is the distribution of um, equities. So in a way, what you, 
you know, what do you observe over the period we've used here, you know, it's around about the last six years, is that the equity the range of distribution of equity returns, you know, illustrates the fat tails that we know about and we worry about, okay? What you can obviously see within the multi-asset portfolio, again, because you've spent so much time ensuring you've got diversified risk, is you significantly mitigate, or you can significantly mitigate tail effects, okay? So in terms of summary, In terms of multi-asset, we can continue to add new asset classes. We can add an illiquidity just to further make the, add to the fun of trying to run portfolios on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the same, but the problem at doing that is there will always be limits to how much diversification benefits you can get. If you look at a broader investment universe, looking for diversification, looking for strategies that, you know, other people might use in different businesses, or looking at things where you can only implement them via derivatives, you're going to greatly expand your investment universe and especially find things that provide diversification. And finally, the most important thing is the end result, because also as investors, as investment managers, you know, we're obviously keen that we provide our customers, our clients with as positive experience on a consistent basis as possible. And you know, it's very much you know, my belief that you know, using a wider investment universe, better diversification, ends up with better results for clients. Okay, um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Malcolm. The discussion is now open to the floor. Um, I'm looking forward to an interesting and stimulating debate and would like to encourage as many members who wish to contribute to do so. May I invite anyone who thinks he or she may wish to contribute to the discussion to let them know their intention. Okay. Um, before I start, this is, my name is Martin White. I'd like to emphasize I'm talking about planning for the long-term future, not for the 10 years, for example, next 10 years, for example. So given that context and the topic of diversification, I want to take any issue with having any concern about short-term volatility at all. Um, I think it's something which we as actuaries, in the context of no liabilities to match in the shorter term, should be far happier to live with than we appear to be. Uh, when you take liabilities out of the question, the intelligent way to think about it is long-term. So let's say you're age 40, investing with the objective of maximizing your spending power from the ages 70 to 95, say, or perhaps even 100. And let's introduce the constraint that you must be able to, supply, to survive a period of hyperinflation. There's no point retiring on a fixed income if the government's going to print money or otherwise default on its debts. I think the quote about living un with uncertainty is absolutely spot on. Um, you have to live, be able to live very happily with the market value of your assets moving about violently. But you don't want to take wipeout risk. So I would say gearing is out. Um, and so is counterparty risk. Will all those European banks or governments stay solvent, for example? So what's my idea of a low-risk asset? It's a portfolio of companies with decent historical return on assets and no or very little gearing. But it would have to be spread a bit across industries and jurisdictions, since whole industries and jurisdictions can fail and wipe you out, and we've seen that in recent memory. There are plenty of examples. I think derivatives are for short-term gambling and useless for long-term, if long-term is your context. If you're trying to ma manage short-term liabilities, it's a different story. What would I, advice would I give to long-term savers about handling long-term uncertainty? It would be to emphasize the importance over time of minimizing expenses and not letting anyone take an annual percentage of your fund. It's possible to get this annual cost down to almost nil if you know where to look. But if you allow something to go to an advisor each year and something to a fund manager, it mounts up. Okay, there are, some fund managers are much, much cheaper than others. Um, retail investors investing in typical funds advised by typical advisors will suffer something in the region of the low 1% per annum. 
If you compound this over the decades, it's not a risk, it's a certainty. So here's my answer to the question posed earlier of where does the actuarial profession believe it has most to add in the realm of portfolio construction. Well, speaking for myself alone, of course, my answer relates to long-term investment only, to that part of your portfolio which you're owning to provide for yourself or your family, perhaps a couple of decades or more ahead. It's to explain to the public first the importance of expenses and how to avoid them. And second, to explain how an intelligent long-term approach is not to worry about market fluctuations, but even to think of falls as opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. So to clarify, if anybody would like to comment, please either wait for the microphone or go to the lectern and wait for the microphone. <laughs> Uh, next contribution, please. From here. Sorry, is it? Ivor Kenner. Um, diversification is to be welcomed. However, it is questionable whether derivatives are the answer. The term derivative covers a multitude of financial products. Anyone can issue a derivative. Anyone can buy a derivative. Derivative buyers do not need to have an insurable interest. The market in derivatives is very large. In his paper on financial corruption, Associate Professor Zhu Zhuxi of Shanghai Jiaotong University writes, research estimates indicate that total US financial product contracts before the outbreak of the crisis amounted to 520 trillion US dollars in which CDS credit default swaps exceeded 60 trillion while the collateral security or material financial assets on which they were based were worth only 2.7 million, trillion, sorry, trillion. Uh, Social Sciences in China, November 2011. This represents a leverage rate of about 200. It would be interesting to learn whether the authors of the paper under discussion are in a position to supply the profession with corresponding up-to-date figures for the world as a whole and for the UK. More recently, Xiao Gang, president of Bank of China, has stated, in the next five years, the top risk to China's financial system is the country's shadow banking system. Beijing Review, February the 14th, 2013. There is a problem of what to invest in. Interest rates are low, inflation is high, longevity is improving, there's a property bubble, the FTSE 100 is based on replacing undesirable components by healthy firms as occasion demands. It is, however, unlikely that derivatives will provide a solution. Thank you. Possibly one of the uh, younger members of the profession here. My name is Philip Howard um, from Mercer, and I advise clients on um, liability driven investment strategies with the use of derivatives. Um, I think one of the key things to remember is that society is leveraged. In the UK, every 40 to 45 year old has borrowed significantly on a mortgage usually to a extent far exceeds the uh, leverage in Malcolm Jones's presentation just now. Similarly, if you're investing in a company, you've got to appreciate what you're investi investing in. You're very much investing in a set of companies which will use derivatives for financial management purposes and they will also be leveraged. A lot of them will have unfunded defined benefit pension schemes and that in itself is a form of leverage which is very much a risk factor. So I think the fact that leverage exists, and it's a scary word, and actually I think, from my experience, leverage, leverage aversion, um, I heard last week uh, someone re refer to it as 
LSD, leverage, shorting, and derivatives, which uh, very much um, is how the average person would respond to leverage, is how, how the average person would respond to LSD in the financial setting. And I think actually what you do find with a lot of strategies, leverage is important to manage, it's important to understand um, what you're going into. So the, the worrying thing about leverage in, in, in my set of events is sets of short squeezes, the long-term capital management instances. But the important thing is you have to understand where you have leverage. And if you have a significant pensions deficit, you have a leverage position. And you have a leverage position in your interest rates, which are um, your liabilities in the form of bonds. Um, and just to counter the earlier comment on a long-term perspective, you can only have a long-term perspective um, in the context of having an ongoing employer for a UK DB pension scheme. So your liabilities are important in the short term because you have no certainty on the covenant of your employer over the next 10 years. And that's an uncertainty that trustees do need to deal with. So I think, generally speaking, for a profession to look forward, I don't think we should outlaw derivatives. I think they should be sensibly managed. And I think we should be involved in that because it is a risk structure which I think we can advise on and we can help our clients look at appropriately. Many of the other points made previously were sort of black and white. Um, I, I, I see it as much more shades of grey which individuals and pension schemes need help to understand. I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Holston, I think it might have been the first slide that was presented suggested that asset class has had moved to greater similarity in their volatilities uh, over the last 10 years. I just wonder whether actually what we're talking about now is actually playing in a very small market and making hay while the sun shines. And as more and more derivatives are used, they too will actually become equally risky and you will cease to gain the diversification benefits. I did actually also then, sitting down, listening to this, realize that there seems to be some alchemy going on we seem to be now talking about being able to make money by minimizing volatility. I'm quite sure that actually money and wealth is created from economic activity. It does seem a shame that investment strategy is actually allocating finance based on volatility. Okay, whilst uh, you perhaps gather, gather your thoughts and uh, think some uh, questions you'd like to ask, uh, I did have a couple myself that I'd uh, that I was wondering about. What was on the diversification measure that, that you employed? And I just wondered how sensitive that measure was to the way in which asset classes were defined. So, for example, if you had um, global equities redefined as a number of different regional equity asset classes, would the level of diversification that was shown in the portfolio reduce? Would the action that you took change at all? Now, in terms of the, the, the numbers, um, not markedly, I don't think. I think you get obviously different, slightly different numbers, but again, the, the overall weight and concentration in assets that broadly behave the same would effectively say a lot of these things, whether they're called, you, you redefine them, all behave similarly. But certainly it's something that could, um, could certainly look at and provide more um, information on. Norman Peer. Uh, so, thank you. I found the paper very useful and interesting introduction. Um, and not detracting from that in any way, um, I did have on a number of occasions in reading the paper a little bit of a sense that I would like um, either a little bit more precision or a little bit more detail. And I know that's difficult in terms of what's the scope of the paper, where should one stop. But as a couple of uh, four examples, you, know, you mentioned collateral provision and uh, the implications of that going forward I think are going to be very significant. Uh, in the opening you mentioned EMIR, uh, but in general the cost uh, of derivatives will depend on the nature of the collateral provisions. And there are a number of risks associated with derivatives in relation to the collateral provision. Not least, that's not better, uh, not least in terms of liquidity risk management. Counterparty risks are uh, obviously managed to some extent by the use of collateral. However, I think uh, it would be worth having a footnote in terms of your comment that 
is the economic risk or the economic return is the same using a derivative as using the underlying. It is provided things don't go wrong. If things go completely wrong, then you've got a completely different position. And for example, counterparty risk, I would argue, is highly correlated with um, many of the underlying exposures in the event of a very severe scenario. You also um, talked about leverage in use of repos, and just as an example, depending on the amount of leverage, that can introduce quite a lot of operational risk. Operational risk, again, could potentially be uh, correlated in very severe uh, scenarios with market disruptions. And then in terms of uh, a comment in relation to sub-additivity in the paper, you mentioned that risks are sub-additive. I, I would personally footnote that to say that it depends on the risk metric and it depends on the distribution that's being assumed. But as I say, I don't wish to detract from the main theme of the paper, which I found very interesting and helpful. Thank you. Okay, another question from me then whilst everybody has a think. Um, in terms of the, the risk measure point that, uh, that was just mentioned, that um, did highlight something that uh, everything here was considered in essentially in a normal world in terms of risk measures being volatility. Have you, have you looked at this at all in, um, in terms of uh, non-normality, in terms of um, value at risk type measures instead of uh, volatility measures? Um, no, but that's obviously further work that we would look to do. I think the way we looked at the work, the data, or the, the way the paper describes it is work in the normal scenario and then uh, depend on effectively a range of different approaches around stress tests to catch out when effectively non-normality uh, occurs to try and measure the effectively you know, the, the tail risk you know, impacts that might exist within a portfolio which again, I suppose, comes back to my point about trying to ensure you've got a, a diverse, uh, as much diversification in your, in your investment risk um, as you can. But again, but in terms of some of the, you know, can we do more sophisticated, or you know, we as a profession probably do more sophisticated modeling on that, then yeah, I'd, 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 I'd agree. I'd like to invite uh, John Rowe to close the discussion. Um, I am missing a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it should be mic'd up. You're mic'd up. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, I've got a microphone. <laughs> I could have been there a long time. Um, okay. So uh, I'd like to thank, you know, thank Malcolm for a very interesting paper. Um, I've written down a few thoughts, and I just went through them quickly with the aim of finishing in about five minutes. Um, I think the first thing is that you can split the paper into to broadly four sections, and those being obviously risk, risk measurement, derivative types, implications for investors, and then risk management. And I think correctly, the majority of the discussion from the floor has focused on the first and last of those, uh, the risk measurement and the risk management which are, are, are probably the two most important areas um, for actuaries, particularly in relation to the topics covered in the, in the paper. I've got a, f uh, a few thoughts on the, the middle two topics, derivative types and implications, and then I'll quickly come on to the, the meat of it. So I think the first point is absolutely there are a wide range of derivative types. Um, I think pre-2008 there was a, a, a pretty high level of confidence that derivative markets would continue to, gr to grow, that liquidity would be there, uh, and that the, the opportunities of using derivatives potentially exceeded the costs of doing so. Um, I think the dry up of liquidity in 2008 and 2009, particularly in smaller markets and more esoteric derivative types, highlighted the size of the problem that that can cause and actually the overcomplacency that can result. And I think one of the things we, we have touched on a couple of times during the discussion is the operational risk. And within that, I would count the rolling of derivative positions, which is a key risk, particularly when they're used more for short-term risk management or longer-term risk management, but with the assumption that you can roll the derivatives. 
And this is one of the things we've actually seen increasingly on the pension fund side with the use, for example, of uh, leveraged guilt funds, which roll that risk over and over again, 30-year positions rolling on an annualised basis. I'm not here to say they're wrong, I'm absolutely not, but what I am saying is it's very important that users of those derivatives understand the risks associated with the continued rolling of them. In fact, even the gainers from, from the Great Recession, uh, some of the, the big the hedge funds that correctly shorted their positions eventually realised they couldn't get mark to markets on them for periods of days and actually started unwinding risk positions despite the fact they were going more and more into the money through sheer panic as to whether or not they'd ever be able to realise those positions. On the implications side, I can understand the, the view that for a long-term liability, uh, which is relatively open-ended to the number of decades, it may be appropriate to focus on the long term. However, with the shortening of defined benefit pension schemes and their closure, that luxury unfortunately does not sit with many of these schemes, particularly in the circumstance where there has been, partly through markets and partly through a falling of real rates, um, a level of underfunding and therefore a requirement to bring down risk levels without moving into one-to-one -one guilt and index linked guilt and similar type assets. So I can see the value in derivatives uh, for, for hedging purposes and I, I think that the key lies in understanding and categorising the risks that they have, such as operational risk. Um, on, on, that, on that point, uh, unfortunately, I, I've unfortunately forgotten, but I hopefully I'll come back. To <laughs> um, the the uh, that's a very, very good point. What a shame. Okay, so um, so moving quickly on to risk measurement and risk management, I do think that the use of of innovative approaches for for risk measurement are essential, and some of the ones highlighted here around true numbers of diversified assets are potentially incremental benefits alongside more traditional approaches. I think the danger with all of these is I think there, is, there, there are certain comments that come through in the paper that are axioms, they are, they are functionally true uh, by design, and then there are others which rely on a, a set of beliefs which are quite understandable, but at the same time may or may not turn out to be true. So if, for example, you take diversifying risks and you take out risks that are less diversifying, it is an axiom to say that that will reduce the risk of the portfolio. What is less clear is that that will improve the risk-adjusted return of the portfolio, because it crucially relies on there being a risk premium associated with the risk that's introduced, or the successful use of active management. And I do think one area that the profession, through its deep statistical understanding and its longer term focus on assets, both historically and looking forwards, this is an area that a lot of value can be added. So for example, if we could break out where, um, where diversifying solutions genuinely can be expected to contain a risk premium because they contain risk, and those where effectively we are reliant on active managers to, to identify and successfully access active opportunities, it gives a far more granular breakdown and understanding to trustees and also to insurance companies around the drivers of the risk reduction. Is it reduced risk and reduced expected return or is it actually something different? Where are these sources coming from? And that of course is one of the benefits of diversification through physical assets, uh, which uh, Malcolm highlighted in his paper you can get relatively long dated histories for them, you can actually look at the risks associated with those asset classes, that can become slightly more esoteric or difficult. And one of the examples given in the paper uh, was the use of a small cap versus large cap US equities to reduce the risk position of a portfolio. Well, generally, small cap equities have a higher market beta than large cap equities. And therefore, it is completely consistent that going long large cap and short small cap will reduce the risk in a portfolio. It's effectively reducing the equity beta of that portfolio. All else equal, it will also reduce the expected return of that portfolio, unless you believe there is a systematic risk premium for large cap, which would go against most historical research, or you believe that the active manager is capable of timing that based on a three or five or one year view. The implication of this is, is that the more that, and I, and I, uh, the, the more that as a, 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 as an institute, we're able to separate the axioms and the fundamental risk drivers from those that, are, that, that rely on active management, I think the stronger position we'll be in. I think it, is, it, will, help, um, it will help investors understand those risks that are systematically expected to provide a return over the long term 
and those which are more reliant on shorter term uh, investor manager choice. I would really leave it there except to, to highlight, the, the, if you like, the key point on derivatives, one that's been recycled for a, a, a number of times um, and, and for prolonged periods, which is the idea that if you're not careful, investors generally split into three groups. The first group being hedge investors, and we could take UK pension schemes, hedging interest rates and inflation in that camp. Then comes speculative investors. Those are seeking to seek a return through the use of any investment. And finally, potentially, come Ponzi investors. And one of, the, one of the important elements of risk management, particularly in relation to derivatives, is that their leverage form massively increases the potential for Ponzi investors. That's not to say that they will be used in that way, but it really brings me back to what the, the most important part of this paper, in my opinion, from the Institute's uh, standpoint, should be the, the diversification uh, and the, the risk measurement, different ways of measuring risk to give us new angles of understanding the positions of our investors. And secondly, the risk management. How are individual fund managers using, hopefully, independent risk calculation, separate from the risk calculations within their portfolios, managing to capture those risks on a forward-looking basis to protect investors overall? Thank you. Okay. Well done. Okay. Uh, thank you to John, and thank you to all contributors uh, for, for your comments. Um, I'll, I'll comment on as many as I can, uh, but I'll, I'll preface it with ultimately, you know, you know derivatives. You know, um, derivatives are an age-old technology. In fact, it's a well-proven technology now. Can derivatives end up in doing bad things? Yes, but to me, that's synonymous with saying, well, the internet's there. It's only used by paedophiles and terrorists, so let's not have it. You know. Clearly you don't because there's many benefits to using the internet and in terms of how we live our lives today. So in terms of you know, derivatives, you know, used prudently, there's many benefits to them. And again, that's something I, I hope might I look to share in the paper that I've written. Um, can they be, derivatives be used for gambling? Yes, they can. Uh, but predominantly, in fact, by, you know, by companies, they're used for hedging uh, investment risks. So, a number of those um, good investment companies the, the first uh, contributor spoke about probably use derivatives as part of their day-to-day -day sensible, prudent management of their multiple geography sales revenues. So again, you know, can we do that? In terms of long-term investing, yeah, I'm, I'm a massive believer in long-term investing. You know, I, I love the idea of putting money away and not looking at it for 10 years. You know, and I can, as a personal investor, I can do that and just not worry on the day-to-day -day or just not freak out as to how my money moves around. Unfortunately, lots of people in the UK don't have that benefit in terms of defined contribution and how defined contribution works with heavy uh, allocations towards equity investment and a limited time span at which they're exposed to that equity risk. I mean, what we we're seeing is broadly coming out is whether you get a good pot from your DC investment or whether you get a poor pot from your DC investment is a result of whether you're in good markets or bad markets. So much as we would not want to have, you know, worry about mark to market ongoing valuations, the reality is in terms of trying to deliver investment solutions for people, in terms of making, providing people with decent incomes for their retirement, it's something we have to deal with. And in terms of, of you know, derivatives, um, you know, they have not done good things, you know, you know, they may not do things, may do bad things. You know, let's face it, multi-asset investment as we know it has really just not delivered over the last 15 years, okay? So, you know, again, prudent use in terms of searching for diversification. I think it's something we just need to, to face as a profession in terms of it's widely used technology. It's used by multiple organizations, investment banks, investment managers around the world. And it's something we have to embrace and adapt you know, to our original sort of historic thinking of how we thought about things. I agree fully with the, the comments on, if you like, the nature of the paper, which focuses really on the quantitative aspects of risk management and not the operational um, issues, of which there's many. 
uh, not least at the moment, the current work on, on the clearing of OTC derivatives, which goes ahead in the US this year and Europe hopefully next year. Again, that will help mitigate counterparty um, risks, uh, but are all these things, you know, problems, issues? Yes, they are. And they, like all you know, risks, they, they have to be dealt with. Liquidity risk is an ongoing concern um, for, for all derivatives, both in terms of collateral and in terms of what derivatives you invest in. And again, we're back to the core point of, you know, using investment management or relying on investment managers to use their prudence and their experience to choose wisely and not poorly. And finally, in terms of the overall you know, comments from John in terms of closing, I agree. I mean, the, the actuarial profession, I fundamentally believe, you know, has the, the skill set and, a, and the capability to provide more work, more insight, more color into the world of risk measurement and risk management as portfolios do evolve over time, do become more, invest in more types of instruments aiming at providing uh, diversification. Okay, so our opportunity as a profession is to recognize that the world is changing and is continuing to change and figure out where we as a profession can, can make a constructive input into the world of uh, investment and diversification. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I'm sure we'll find a, a very interesting paper with um, extremely interesting new concepts in there and also ideas for further analysis in a number of areas relating to diversification, derivatives and portfolio construction. So it remains for me to express my own thanks and I'm sure the thanks of all of us to the author, the closer and all of those who participated in this evening's discussion. So thank them in the uh, usual way. Thank you.